it's Sunday afternoon. That means it's time for the Money Show this Sunday afternoon, May 1st, 2005. Ah, May. Gee whiz, can you imagine spring is already about, what, six weeks old? And we're still shivering if we go out in short sleeve shirts. It is amazing. I guess you would call this an Indian winter as opposed to an Indian summer or just plain summer. In any event, it is May, and in the merry month of May, we're here to talk about your money, your savings, the economy, the stock market, gold, whatever has to do with money. And I'm your host, Terry Brown. If you have a question or a comment, just give me a call at 1-800-259-9231. You also can email me. The email address is question at Harry brown.org question at harrybrown.org and once again the phone number 1-800-259-9231 before getting to the topic I had in mind for today let me take a couple of questions that came in just before the broadcast and I will address them first the first one is from Don out in cyberspace who says in your book, Failsafe Investing, you talk about balancing the portfolio when a component is 8% above or below the average. One day, unless I'm mistaken, I heard you use a 10% figure during one of your broadcasts. Such numbers can make significant differences in outcomes. What number should we be trusting the most at this point based on past experience? Or does it make little difference between 8 and 10%? Well, I don't usually think of it as the amount off 8 or 10%, but rather the absolute amount. And let me back up a little and explain just for anybody who is new to this show and new to the permanent portfolio concept, what I advocate for the money you cannot afford to lose is to have a balanced and diversified portfolio that will protect you whatever may come. And my selection as the best way to do this is to set up a portfolio that is 25% in stocks, 25% in gold, 25% in bonds, and 25% in cash. Now, the reasons for that are not germane to this particular question, but if anybody has questions about the reasons for these investments being chosen, uh, just let me know. Call 1-800-259-9231 or email me. But the point is that this is a permanent portfolio. You don't tinker with it just because you think stocks are likely to go up or stocks are likely to go down. You just hold on because you recognize this is an uncertain world, and no matter how inevitable a rise or fall in anything seems to be, it isn't necessarily going to happen. Now, the only thing is that as market changes in the prices of these investments will cause the 25% figures to skew after a while. After a while, you're going to find you have 28 or 30% in one of the investments and 20 or 21% in one of the others. It doesn't make any difference that these changes take place until they get to the point where you have too much invested in one of them and too little in something else. And that point, in my mind, is 35% Anytime one of the investments has reached 35% of the total value of the portfolio or fallen to 15% of the total value of the portfolio, at that point you need to rebalance. And you do that by selling enough of whatever is over 25% to bring it back to 25% and using the proceeds to buy whatever is below 25% to bring it up to 25%. Now, if you, uh, let me back up. I picked those figures, 35 and 15. There is no scientific basis for it. It just seems to me that that is an appropriate time to rebalance, that if you get beyond 35%, you're in real danger then of that investment falling and taking a large part of the value of the portfolio with it. Or if it gets down to 15%, then you're in a position where when that investment, that is now only 15% of the portfolio, starts to rise, it's not going to be powerful enough to carry the whole portfolio up with it. Now, I picked them partly also 
on the basis that you do not want to pay attention to this portfolio. You don't want to have to monitor it often, meaning you don't have to check to see what the value of each of the four investments is and what percentage it is of the total portfolio. Uh, and I figure you need to do that, just look and see where they are once a year, or when you are aware that something very gigantic has happened. You hear on the news that the stock market fell 500 points today or something of that sort. You may then want to just sit down with a copy of the Wall Street Journal or Barron's or the Daily Paper may have everything you need and just check the values of the investments, figure out what the percentages are. Now, if you are paying more attention to these things and you don't mind doing it more often, you may want to rebalance a little bit more actively, and in that case, you might pick a figure like 32 or 33 percent as the point at which you'll rebalance, and 17 or 18 percent at the bottom. And uh, you may even go for 20 and 30 as the limits. But that will be up to you because there isn't a scientific basis here. Uh, the only disadvantage of doing it at 20 and 30 is that you just have to do it more often and you may incur transaction costs more often because you might find yourself balancing in May, say, and buying more gold and selling some stocks. Uh, if you're using a no-load mutual fund, that will not make any difference, but the gold will have transaction costs. But then you find... Uh, six months later, you have to rebalance again, but this time you're selling a little gold and maybe buying a little bit of stocks. Or was that what I said before? <laughs> yes. Anyway, doing the opposite of what you had done just six months before. In other words, you might find yourself over-trading. But uh, for most people, I think the 15 and 35% figures are uh, perfectly appropriate. That would have gotten you out of a lot of your stocks, for instance, when the big three-year bear market started back at the beginning of this century. And it would have uh, allowed you to take profits in what had been acquired in the 1990s in stocks. I hope that answers the question, Don. If it doesn't, just follow up with it, and we'll, we'll take it further. Uh, we have a question from Hank in New Jersey who says, uh, I realize you recommend the purchase of gold coins, but I don't recall ever hearing you mention sales tax as a consideration. In New Jersey, we have a 6% sales tax, and that's a pretty big hit to take at the outset. And if you purchase the coins out of state, then you are supposed to pay the 6% as a use tax to New Jersey if you take physical possession of the coins here. Well, that really is a problem. There are a lot of states that do not charge sales tax on gold coins because they're considered an investment. It would be the same as charging a sales tax when you buy stocks or bonds, and that would make the, the trading of securities just completely uh, impractical. So my suggestion to you, first of all, Hank, is to uh, look at the states nearby and see if there's a way of buying in a no sales tax state and maybe opening a bank account, small bank account at a bank in one of those states where you buy the coins and store the coins in a safe deposit box there. That way you're not taking delivery in New Jersey. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please don't go away. We've got a lot more to talk about, and you can join this 1-800-259-9231 if you have a question. This is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Fail Safe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Fail Safe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. Or you can send me an email, question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org. Hank also asked in his email, complaining about sales tax in New Jersey, and you've got a lot to complain about there, Hank. He also asked about some alternatives, and that is buying gold through the Perth Gold Certificate Program. And he also asked about the S&P deposit receipts as a substitute for a no-load mutual fund for the stock market portion. I don't know anything about either. I will look into them this week and try to give you some feedback on this next weekend. However, as far as the mutual fund, uh, uh, pardon me, as far as the deposit receipts versus a no-load mutual fund, I don't see any point, really. You're not saving anything in transaction costs. In fact, you may have to pay a commission on that, whereas you wouldn't with a no-load mutual fund. And I just can't see any particular advantage in doing so, uh, even if it turns out that they cover the S&P 500. And with the Perth Gold Certificate Program, I'm not keen on certificates. I like to see a custodial account. Now, the difference is, if you have a certificate, that's a debt of the Perth uh, company. That company owes you so much gold. It does not have your gold stored in a particular place with your name on it as a warehouse. Rather, it is just like a bank that owes you the money that's in your bank account. And it is a liability of the company. If the company goes broke, then the creditors have to scramble around to try to get in line and try to get what is theirs. If you store the gold in a foreign bank in a custodial account, what happens is the bank puts the gold coins in a bag, puts your name on the bag, and sticks it in the vault. And if you walk in there one day and say, I want my gold, they will go to the vault and get the bag that has your name on it. Now, that means if the bank goes broke, what happens is that uh, your gold is your gold, and it has nothing to do with the liabilities that the bank owes to various different people, uh, creditors uh, outside the bank, depositors, uh, you know, so on. And so, once again, all you have to do is to ask for your gold, and it will be yours. You don't really have to go in and ask for it, but however you ask for it, it will get to you. As I said, though, I'll take a look at these two items this week and let you know on next week's show. It's interesting that there are always bulls and bears regarding any investment, stocks, gold, bond, commodities, whatever it is. Uh, There are always bulls and bears, but there are particularly strong feelings and a lot of people on each side of the aisle with regard to the stock market right now. There are people who figure that this 10,000 level is a plateau from which the market is going to spring upward and take it to who knows where, 12,000, 13,000, 14,000. I don't know. I haven't seen many precise Uh, targets for these things. But on the other hand, there are a lot of people who figure that once the market breaks through 10,000 on the downside, that we are in for a good lengthy fall, lengthy in time and lengthy in distance. And there are arguments on both sides, as there always are, but it is particularly interesting right now because there are so many strong feelings on both sides of the aisle with regard to that. 
And even though I do not recommend trading stocks for the permanent portfolio, for the money you can't afford to lose, I do say that with any additional money that you have, once you have figured you are doing what you need to do about your retirement, you're doing what you need to do about your children's education or saving for a house or whatever it may be, that you still have some extra money you can afford to play around with, then there's nothing wrong with speculating, with trying to time the investments in stocks, bonds, gold, whatever, and knowing that if you lose that money, you haven't lost anything that's precious to you. So you may want to take a flyer right now in the stock market with money that you can't afford to lose. So let's look at some of the arguments that come up on both sides. I'm taking this from a report that was issued by Steve Luthold in March, in which he brought up the current arguments for bulls and bears. So I'm going to take his arguments that he brought up and discuss them from my viewpoint. He's, uh, this is one where he says, in terms of valuation benchmarks, we view the stock market as overvalued when compared to historical norms. However, the current degree of overvaluation pales when compared to some past extremes like 1999 or 1987. Yes, an overvalued market can and has become significantly more overvalued, and so today we estimate that it's possible for the market to go up further from here. Well, the overvaluation it means that the person has looked at such indicators as the actual assets that company owns, uh, their sales, uh, and that's the way they determine whether an individual stock is undervalued or overvalued fundamentally. And they do the same thing with the market as a whole. What are the total assets of the S&P 500 companies? What are their total sales? And how do these compare with the prices that they are asking uh, for the stock these days and so on. And all of this is very good, but as he points out, an overvalued stock, meaning one that is being priced too high in the market, can go higher. Speculation occurs because markets seem to be out of skew. Uh, you buy a stock, if you are concerned about fundamental value, you buy a stock when it seems to be selling for less than its fundamental value. Uh, and you sell it when it seems to be more. But the mere fact that it can be less than its fundamental value or more than its fundamental value tells you that it could go even further in that direction, that there is no particular limit to it. The market can become way overvalued. The market can become way undervalued. And so there is no point in which you look at it and say, hey, the figures tell me that it's undervalued or overvalued. This applies just as well to uh, an individual stock, an individual uh, commodity of any kind, or to something more general like gold. Whatever it is, it can become more of that. So you find it very, very difficult to use fundamental analysis in a practical way. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes and continue this look at the market and the overvalue or undervalue or bull or bear cases. You can give me a call at 1-800-259-9231 if you have anything on your mind. And we will be back right after these messages. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. 
That's libertyfree.com. Hello again, Harry Brown here, and we are talking about the bullish and bearish factors concerning the stock market. All right, another bullish factor that was mentioned in this report is that typical post-World War II economic expansions run about four years, although the two latest U.S. expansions were of record length, eight to nine years. I might note that the current expansion will be four years old in late 2005. Will the current expansion be typical or extended? Uh, that's from this report that I'm using just simply to pick out common bull and bear arguments that are being made today. All right. He's saying that an expansion, meaning a boom period, a period between recessions, typically runs about four years, but the last two, in the 80s and the 90s, ran eight to nine years. All right, what, was, what he's saying is, you don't know how long this current expansion is going to run. And the current expansion has not been all that exciting, except for about one year in it. And the point that I want to make here is that it doesn't really matter what the typical one was. The typical one, or the average one, or the mean one, or however they describe it, is really an average of all of the expansions that have taken place, or of any other phenomenon that somebody might say is germane to trying to decide where we are in terms of uh, investments or the economy. There may have been expansions of six years or two years or five years or three years or whatever it is, but they average four years. What I'm trying to say is that this tells you nothing. When people quote these things, all they're telling you is what the average experience has been in the past, and the average experience is meaningless because it may be an average of two great extremes. It could be... And it isn't, but it could be that the typical uh, expansion is four years because there have been many expansions of one year and other expansions of seven years. And as a result, you have an average of four years, but that doesn't tell you anything because it could be anywhere from one to seven years. So my point is simply ignore this. The next uh, item, interest rates may move up a bit, but will remain at historically low levels. Well, it doesn't matter whether they're at historically low levels. If interest rates start moving upward, it will be difficult for the stock market. Uh, There are two reasons for this. Number one is that at that point, some money will start moving into bonds because the bonds will seem more attractive, offering a rate that one can count on for however long one intends to hold the bonds, five years, ten years, whatever it is, and a lot of people will switch to bonds as a result because of that fixed yield that they have compared with what the stock market seems to be producing now and the uncertainty of what it will produce in the future. You also have the problem that uh, it's harder for people to borrow to buy on margin, and that takes away some buying power from the stock market. So interest rates rising do affect the stock market negatively. It doesn't mean that a 1% rise in interest rates guarantees a fall in the stock market. It just means that it's more pressure on the stock market that it has to overcome. So here again, Even though an indicator may be negative for the market, it doesn't mean the market is going to go down. Let me interrupt this now because I have another question that has come in. It does have a little to do with what we're talking about. Dave out in cyberspace says, let me play devil's advocate here. Can you not imagine a scenario where, number one, interest rates rise dramatically? Number two, stocks fall from this rise in sympathy. And number three, gold also falls, caused by the tightening of the money from the interest rate rise. Is this not plausible, and wouldn't this knock three pillars out from under the permanent portfolio? 
In other words, if interest rate, rates ro rose, it would be bad for stocks, it would be bad for bonds. And Dave is saying, well, couldn't it also be bad for gold? Well, it's interesting that I have seen this argument in the past that interest rates are, are high and therefore gold is going to fall. I saw it in the late 70s when people said that gold couldn't go any higher, and yet for another year or two it did go not just higher but spectacularly higher. And probably in the very, very long run, interest rates would be bad for gold. But I think the difference between the effect on gold and the effect on stocks and bonds is simply that the gold market is not nearly as big as the stock market is. And it doesn't take a great deal of buying power to move gold up powerfully, whereas it does take a lot of buying power to move the stock market up. So the effect that interest rates has ha, might have on any of these investments is going to probably have a much more dampening effect on on uh, stocks than it would on gold. Now, I can't give you an authoritative answer on that, but I can give you an answer from experience, and that is that so far, interest rates have risen during periods of inflation, and the mere fact of inflation has caused the rise in gold. Inflation causes gold to go up because the dollar is the most popular form of currency in the world. People hold it all over the world for various reasons, as a store of value, as a hedge against their own currency, as a means of uh, conducting international business, as a form of last resort in case they feel they might have to flee the country that they're in because people in other countries, many other countries, suffer a great deal more political turmoil than we do in this country. So there are people holding dollars for a lot of reasons. Dollars are very liquid. They're recognized anywhere in the world, and people feel uh, that it is safe. And they don't really worry about the currency, currency price changes in the dollar. But when inflation seems to be threatening the future value of the dollar, when inflation in the U.S. gets up to 5 or 6%, then some of those people holding the dollars will decide that this doesn't look like the safe, secure form of last resort that I thought it was. Maybe I better get rid of some of these dollars or all of these dollars and turn to the second most popular form of money in the world, which is gold. Not the euro, not the yen, not the British pound, but gold. And not the Swiss franc either. Now, that situation might change in the future. The euro may move up into second place or maybe even first place someday. But that isn't the situation now. The situation now is that the dollar is obviously the most popular form of money in the world and gold is the second most popular form. And so when inflation threatens the dollar, it is good for gold because some people holding dollars switch to gold. That happens whether interest rates are rising or falling. The interest rates in the U.S. do not affect the gold market elsewhere. And that brings us to the final and most important reason that this doesn't affect gold the way it affects stocks. And I'll give you that when we come back. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. back this is harry brown and uh dave asked about gold possibly falling during a period of high interest rates well the last reason and you may have guessed it all read it ready that gold is not affected by high interest rates nearly as much as stocks is because we're talking about u.s stocks and even though foreigners buy u.s stocks it is primarily a u.s market but gold is a worldwide market and is not affected nearly as much by changes in interest rates in the U.S. as stocks would be, simply because stocks are basically a U.S. market and gold is not. Uh, it's like saying, would the Swiss franc or the British pound be affected by high interest rates in the U.S.? Not at all. It wouldn't be, be affected other than in terms of 
the adjustment of the currency rate. Well, we've looked at some bullish factors, and there's some more here, but in order to get in some bearish factors before the end of this show, let me skip over to them. Um, one of them is the cyclical bull market is mature in terms of magnitude and duration. Well, again, those people who believe in a four-year stock market cycle uh, are really just taking the idea that stocks tend to go up for four years and then they go down. <clears throat> but they are just working with an average. And any bull market in stocks could last for five years, six years, seven years. And so that's not important. Then, however, here's one that is more significant, and that is continued rising oil prices and the supply shortage of oil would clearly be a bearish factor. Yes, it is, but it's questionable as to how much fundamentally it affects the market. It certainly affects investor sentiment. Investors get worried when they see such things, and they think, well, airplanes are uh, going to have to use very expensive fuel, and that's going to affect the airlines, and it's going to affect transportation of getting goods to market and so forth. But in the final analysis, just how much does the price of petroleum contribute to the cost of items in the U.S. It certainly contributes something, but overall, does it contribute a great deal? I would have uh, thought that somebody who thought that oil prices were significant would have said way back when they were 25 or 30, when oil was 25 or 30 dollars a barrel, would have said, "My goodness, if oil goes to 55 dollars a barrel, the stock market will be down to 5,000." the Dow Jones, or less. And yet, that hasn't been the case with oil at $55 a barrel. So how do we know what oil at $75 a barrel would do to the stock market? We don't. Point involved? These things appear to have great importance, but do they really have importance in the final analysis? Well, if they appear to have importance, then they're going to affect the market in the short term as investors get uh, or speculators get very, very antsy about it, and many of them sell. But in the long run, does it have any effect on the fundamental value of the stocks in the market? Most cases, the items that are raised as being important don't. All right, the federal budget is likely to rise rather than fall. Well, that certainly is a strong possibility. But in all my years at looking investments at investments, I've never noticed that a budget deficit has a big effect in the long term on stocks. It may again in the short term, if suddenly it appears that the budget deficit is going to be two hundred billion more than it was supposed to be. Uh, that can shock the market for a few days, but it's something that is quickly forgotten. Yes, the budget deficit means the federal government will have to borrow more, and it may have some effect on interest rates. But the borrowing of the federal government, or especially the changes in borrowing, are really insignificant compared to the total uh, credit market in the United States, the total amount of debt that is financed and refinanced and refinanced over again. So... Uh, again, I don't think that the budget deficit is a very important factor in this. Although I will point out that the administration's rosy scenario of cutting the debt in half within five years is meaningless. Uh, it, it is very, very unlikely to happen. I won't bother going into that right now, but let me just say that I think it is very, very unlikely. All right. That uh, is all the bearish factors that were noted here. So let me go back to the bullish factors. Inflation remains tame and is expected to remain tame during 2005. Well, that may be and it may not be. If inflation rises, however, it's not going to have a significant effect at first. Right now, inflation is running about 3%, which is higher than it had been in recent years when it was 1% or 2%. And all of this, of course, is quite low when you consider that inflation was running around 12% in 1974 and around 15% in 1981. 
So we are blessed right now with a low inflation rate, and I think that it is more likely that inflation will rise to 5, 6, 7 percent or even more than it is that it's going to fall to 1 percent again for the time being. But how much effect will this have? I don't think it'll have much effect at 4 or 5 percent, but it will if it gets to 6, 7, 8 percent and moves on from there. But that 4, 5, 6 percent is probably the likely scenario for the near future. So I don't think we can look at inflation and say that that determines what's going to happen. Well, time for a break. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. Stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Failsafe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. Well, I hope that happy music sends you off uh, not just on this nice day, which happens to be sunny here in Tennessee. I hope it is where you are, but also on this week and this merry, 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 merry month of May. And before I talk about why it is that I brought up these bullish and bearish factors today, let me be, make sure to thank you very, very much for tuning in today. I don't want to run out of time suddenly and not be able to tell you how much I appreciate your letting me come into your home or office and talk about these things. And I want to thank John Harmon in Minnesota, who took care of all the technical work that's necessary for me to be able to talk with you. Now, about these bullish and bearish factors. I've tried to knock down each one because I don't see any value in any of these indicators. And I'm using these indicators that I've brought up as a proxy for all indicators. Oh, yes, I have checked. I did my computer work here. I went back uh, 40 years, and I find that every time A happens, B follows. Well... If that may just be coincidence, and coincidence means that the next time A happens, F may follow, or Z, or whatever. And any indicator is usually, as I said, uh, just an average of things that have happened in the past, and that average can uh, be an average of very, very wide swings in one direction or the other. Let me put it to you straight. The stock market, the gold market, The bond market, the commodities markets, the currency markets in the short term are mysteries. There is no one who can tell you what's going to happen next week or next month in any of these markets. Over the long term, you may see trends, yes, and you may see reasons that something ought to happen over the next year or two. But in the short term, all these markets are mysteries. I tell you, I have been associated with the investment world much longer than I want to admit to simply because I've reached the point in life where I don't want to tell my age anymore and I don't want people figuring it out from my saying how long I've been in the investment world. But I can tell you I've met many celebrities in the investment world. I have read umpteen books. I have received umpteen, umpteen, umpteen newsletters. I have been to seminars, I've heard lectures, I've heard this, I've heard that. I have never in all of these years come across anyone 
with whom I would feel comfortable giving him precious metal and say, mon- precious money and saying, in, uh, invest this for me, speculate for me, and make sure that I make a profit over the next month or two. I don't care how many calls in a row somebody has made or how many times in a row an indicator has worked, it's probably going to stop working the moment you put your money on it. So instead, use the money you can't afford to lose for a balanced portfolio and then, if you want, speculate to your heart's content with money you can afford to lose. All right, come back next week because we're going to have another show. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much. Have a good week. Thank you.